Well, <clears throat> I'm making a video tonight that I was hoping I wouldn't have to make. It's very disappointing to me with all the time I've invested and all the time you guys have invested. But I'm sorry to say, Helson has called it quits. He surrendered. We've won. This war is over. So this is my Scenario 2 campaign <clears throat> versus Helson. Um, we started this maybe about nine months ago. And we're <laughs> only in February 1942. Over the last few months, it's s slowed down to a snail crawl. And <clears throat> to be honest with you, I was getting the feeling for a while now that he just wasn't into this anymore. Uh, obviously, we've done well. Um, have we done so well that he should be quitting right now? In my opinion, no. Uh, but what we're going to do tonight is we're actually going to look at the game from his perspective because as part of the terms of his surrender I did request that he give me his password so I can look at the map and see where he had his stuff and what he was doing and so I can try to figure out like was he justified in calling it quits and, and giving up um, again in my opinion no but this is going to be kind of a long video because we're going to get a chance to see the campaign from his side and where all of his stuff is at so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start in a clockwise pattern, kind of near Alaska. And I'm just going to go around the map and we're going to talk about some stuff. Uh, I hope I answer some questions you guys may have. If I miss something, if there's something else you want to know, uh, in the comments or on Discord, please let me know what it is you'd like me to show you from his side. But taking a look at the Alaska AOR, in hindsight, I wish I had pushed a, a bit harder up here. Because all the way up until Kodiak, all of this stuff here is basically undefended. So I could have had all of that without much fight at all. He has nothing. He's about 150 AV here and about 150 there. But I could have taken all of Alaska and he wouldn't be able to stop us. <clears throat> On the West Coast, it's the typical stuff, right? He's got his pilot training at Eastern USA, right? Nothing particularly noteworthy here. Okay. Uh, on the Western USA, we do see that he's got a few battleships, which is completely normal. Okay. Uh, over here in San Francisco, we see he's got a lot of the uh, units that come out of uh, Philippines. He looks like he disbanded them just to get him out of there, and now they respawn in San Francisco. Otherwise, I don't see anything particularly exciting here. Uh, taking a look at Pearl, usual stuff again. Some units training here. Looks like he did leave one of his Devastator units behind. And we're going to talk about where his carriers are at because I found them all. But it looks like he decided that this uh, torpedo squadron was not worth bringing along. And he left it back just to do uh, naval bombing training. I guess he was satisfied with this personally i would have taken these 70 pilots put them in the pool and started training more torpedo pilots because the allies are chronically short of torpedo training squadrons early on but hey that that's just nitpicky uh one thing that i was really interested to see was where the heck is his logistics train and i think i figured out what he was doing although it does in my opinion it does seem a bit underdeveloped so I had surmised early on that he was coming in from West USA, coming down near Malden Island and Caroline, coming into Tahiti area, and then running along the bottom of the map. And what I'm seeing here kind of proves that, right? He's developed the base of Tahiti. He's unloading troops at Rapa, right? So it, it lends credence to what I thought. So he was coming down through here, coming down through here. And then hooking it. Now watch this. Look what I found. <clears throat> Map edge. He has a bunch of fighter squadrons loaded up here. It looks like one, two, three, four, possibly five fighter squadrons running along the bottom of the map. You notice that they're completely unescorted though, which I think is, is kind of dangerous. Uh, I had already kind of picked up on the fact that I thought he was riding on the map edge. So on my side of the campaign, I have about three subs down here rocking the map edge. And if we had come across these guys, we would have ripped them up. 
So kind of dangerous to be sending unescorted ships this way. But anyway, it does appear that he was coming down and riding the edge of the map and coming into New Zealand first. So right here we see a bunch of stuff coming in here. Okay. A lot of troops. Supply. We see him unloading fuel. And if we take a look at New Zealand, we see that he's got a lot of fuel there. And at Auckland, a lot of supplies. So it does appear he did get a couple convoys into New Zealand before I was able to pick up on it. So this was definitely a major staging area for him. And I thought it would be. Because we couldn't find his convoys anywhere else. Alright. Also, I see he had a lot of picket ships out here. Look at this. These are all picket ships. So just AKLs that are sitting out here as guard ships. In case we were trying to get down into here to raid his convoys. He had, he had stuff here. I never knew it. Guarding it. Okay. I find this to be a little interesting. He's moving supplies and troops, equipment into Hobart which is in Tasmania for the life of me I cannot figure out why he would do this I don't know what the benefit of putting um, a US troops in Hobart why not just get him into Melbourne and rail them up into Australia I don't know okay also looks like he was bringing in supplies either uh, into Melbourne this way or into Adelaide here now on the rest of the map over here, we see very little activity at Perth and no convoys whatsoever that I can detect coming into Perth. So it does not appear that he was making any effort to supply Australia from Cape Town. I haven't been able to find that. Uh, what is this? Okay. He's strapped moving. These are US infantry. Looks like he's moving them to Perth. Maybe he was concerned about um, us invading Perth. But you notice he did not change their... Hmm. I don't know. Whatever. Let's go run. Let's keep going. So, if things get real interesting as we get up into uh, Cape Town, wait till you see what I found. A lot of ships. And look at these troop numbers, guys. Look at all these U.S. troops here. Construction, tank battalions, aviation... Uh, look at this. 40th Infantry Division going into Cape Town. Bunch of uh, coastal anti-aircraft regiments. Aircraft squadrons. So a huge amount of U.S. troops coming in and a lot of fuel and supply. Gosh, look at this. <clears throat> I can't believe that. This is like more supply than all of Japan has. <laughs> so moving a lot of troops into Cape Town, right? And then troops leaving Cape Town... Uh, what do we got in here? That stuff coming back in. Look at this. Coming off map to on map. Look at these troop numbers. 27th Infantry Division going to Karachi. 41st Infantry Division to Bombay. 41st Infantry Division into Karachi. So he's splitting them up. Another squadron going into Karachi. Subs going into Bombay. So he was moving a lot a lot of stuff into Bombay and Karachi, right? Um, you can see up here troops, supplies, everything coming into Karachi. Squadrons right here. Two squadrons coming into Karachi. More troops there. And look at this. Where's it at? Oh, Indomitable. The British carrier Indomitable sitting up here in Karachi collecting dust. I have no idea what it's doing. But the squadrons are all set to training. So one British carrier at Karachi. Now, let's come back down. I want to show you this. And this, I, I was suspecting it and it's confirmed. All of the American carriers are in India. So right here we have the Saratoga Enterprise heading to Bombay with the Repulse and a very decent escort. We also see here, look at this, the Yorktown and Lexington. And you notice this is the damage from the Yorktown that we hit it with a torpedo a couple turns ago. That torpedo did very little to the Yorktown. This aircraft carrier is still completely um, viable. Um, 
but yeah, all of the American carriers are in Austra uh, in India, and I thought they were. And I'm looking on the carriers, and it looks like he left all of his uh, TBD squadrons behind. And instead went with more Dauntlesses and more fighters. Let's see, it's Lexington, right? No TBDs there. Saratoga. Lots of Dauntlesses, no TBDs. Enterprise. Vindicators, Buffaloes, Dauntlesses, and no TBDs. So he left all of the American torpedo squadrons back and is only operating fighters and dive bombers, which honestly, at this time of the war, is, um, it makes sense to me. So there we go. All U.S. carriers are over here. So two here, two here, and they're all moving to Bombay, and a lot of his troops are moving into Bombay too. So he had a mountain of troops, probably over well over a thousand AD plus a ton of supporting squad uh, like infantry units moving to Bombay and Karachi and they would have been there within a month or less so it does appear that my suspicions were correct carriers were operating and they were going to be uh, coming into Bombay yeah so there we go now we know that um, okay now that we know where the carriers are at, let's take a look at the South Pacific. And honestly, uh, I have some mixed feelings about this. So on my Discord, a lot of people were telling me, go for Pago Pago, go for Pago Pago. You got to take it, you got to take it. And looking at it now, it's not defended at all. There's no aircraft there. He made no effort to even supply it, guys. This thing is like, I, I, I don't even get it. Zero supplies there. So it would have been a pushover to take Pago Pago. So... What I'm seeing here is he completely abandoned it and had no intention of defending. Kind of wish I'd gone for it now, but I was worried about enemy ships intervening. And I always said that I needed carrier support to take Pago, right? I suspected his carriers were in India. I couldn't be sure. And now that I'm looking at it, look at this. At Aitutaki, there is a substantial surface fleet here. Two battleships, three heavy cruisers, four light cruisers, and five destroyers. More than enough to wreck any invasion I would have attempted on Pago. Um, and I had already elected to move Kido Butai, which is about here, north. I was going to head back towards India to confront his carriers, which I suspected were there. But with a fleet like that sitting two days sailing from Pago, uh, I am glad now that I elected to stop attacking basically here right because these guys would have intervened at pago and completely shredded anything i sent over there because i did not have anything near like that to support an invasion of pago so i am glad that we didn't do it because that that would have been bad uh looking at the rest of the south pacific over here canton is hardly defended baker's not defended um we could have really pushed hard into South Pacific if I had wanted to because he just did not make any attempt to defend any of this other than that all right looking into Solomon's we'd already captured it all so there's nothing here a couple subs and we already felt we already found out about those with the um, <clears throat> AOs coming through here a while back let's start looking at Australia now okay um, a fair amount of troops in Melbourne a lot of units training in the backfield over here, like way back. Sydney has very little aircraft and a decent amount of troops. And some of these are... Okay, those are Australian. Never mind. I'm trying to see if there's any... Yep, there's one. A couple U.S. Uh, units here. Now, moving up to Brisbane. A lot of subs. And... The bulk of the U.S. American aircraft, the Banshees, the P-40 Warhawks, are way down here. I would have figured he would have moved them into Townsville or something. Uh, as you can see, he's building that up. He didn't make any attempt to challenge us on the air up here at all. All of his aircraft are back here in Brisbane. Um, now, what I do see is that he was moving a lot of support units 
a lot of support units back towards Townsville. And here at, at Cairns, a massive force um, was coming to retake Cooktown. You can see they're on the road here. They are going to come up here and take Cooktown back. And they would have taken it with that much force. <coughs> I had nowhere near enough to challenge this force. I was already in the process of pulling out of Cooktown anyway. But if these troops had gotten there before I was done, it would have been bad. So I'm glad I had elected to pull out of Cooktown when I did. Because in a month they would have been up here and it would have been a mess. Okay, let's start looking at the Dutch East Indies. Darwin, completely undefended, by the way. I could have taken that with a couple of Naval Guard units, honestly. I don't know what he did with all these units, but he pulled them out of here. Oh, there they are. Looks like he moved almost all of them uh, out of Darwin. Looks like he was going to make no attempt to defend up here at all. Dutch East Indies looked more or less what I thought, but I, didn't see th I did see this here. He had some PBYs kind of stuck on this little dot base. And this is why you guys need to clean up your dot bases in the Dutch East Indies. Because you have these little covert operations out here. I had no idea this was here the entire campaign. Obviously, they're out of supply. They can't fly missions. But he could have probably moved them out. He had a... Uh... Well, no, they had supply. So never mind. He had everything he needed to operate these PBYs here. And I did not know they were there. Um, looking on Java, uh, Bandung would have been a mess for us to take. 900 AV, okay, plenty of supply, 37,000, that would have lasted him a while. Uh, a lot of full strength Dutch units, okay. And looking at almost up to size 4 fortifications on Bandung. That would have been so crappy. We would have eventually got there probably within a month. Uh, no, about two weeks of, of campaign time. We would have been in here, but I, I'll tell you right now. At best, I would be on parity with him at Bandung. Um, and this siege would have taken a while. Because this is mountain terrain. He's got a lot of supply. And it, it would have been really gnarly to try to take that out. Um, Batavia defended by about 100 um, AV. And they're in strat mode. I'm not quite sure why they're in strat mode still. I don't know where he was moving them to. Okay, Sumatra was basically cleaned up. There's almost nothing left here. Just a few units, and I knew about all of these. So Sumatra was no threat at all. Uh, a couple stranded units in Borneo. These were non-issue. Obviously nothing in, in this part of Malaya. We already captured that. Let's talk about the Philippines, which gave me a lot of trouble. Um, on Mindanao, uh, I think we would have had some issues taking Malaybole. Because all I had was about 100 AV, 180 AV of, of naval guard units here against his almost 400, which were in supply, in basically decent shape, and surprisingly not fort building forts at all. I don't really get that. He didn't have a lot of engineers, but I would have maybe tried to make an attempt to build some forts there. It still would have taken us a while to reduce these guys. All these central islands, Leyte, Cebu, Panay... Samar. They had the usual troops on there. Nothing nothing to write home about. And they were all out of supply. So these would have been basically pushovers to come in here and take everything except basically Cebu. Because it does make its own supply. That would have been a bit of an issue. The rest of these would not have been. Okay. On Luzon, he had these units up here at Vigan, Apari, uh, Tugugurau, and Bayombong. I did not realize it but these guys were completely out of supply if we had I had contemplated starting another invasion of the Philippines and moved up a couple army units this way and moved other forces this way to just take these guys out it would have been a pushover they had no supply and they were blocked from having supply by all the bases that we controlled so why he ever elected to move up here I have no idea uh, Clark Field on the other hand was in absolutely no danger of falling anytime soon. 42,000 supply, which is a ton. That, that's going to last for months. Uh, the units were more or less in, in decent shape. Okay. 
and the forts size 3 forts so Clark Field would have been a very very hard base to take I estimate with this much supply and that many troops there it would have taken us about till July of 1942 to even have a chance of taking out Clark so the Philippines was not gonna go easily but my you know Desert Wolf always said who cares like it's just a big prison camp and it really is but it's just an eyesore on the map right when you're looking at the map you see all this red and you got the stupid Philippines over here with all that green oops and man um, that would have taken a while so we could have cleaned up these guys pretty easily but trying to get these guys mm -mm. I would have needed a lot more troops and a lot more time to bomb now if you look at we did a pretty decent job keeping damage on the bases here airfield damage and runway damage is pretty good here at Clark the same we kept the damage pretty high which kept him from building forts and it did slowly chip away at his supply but not enough 42,000 is a lot of supply yeah so that's the Philippines now let's get to India and we're getting kind of close here now you'll notice this guys I had no idea he had this many subs here what well, that's almost 10 submarines no it is 10 submarines and you know what they were doing Jack um, apparently Helson is of the opinion that you don't have to give these guys uh, multi-hex patrol zones I don't I don't see it that way and the, and the problem is here is that they don't really move if they don't have any detection on something they're not gonna move to engage and what I'd been doing because I thought there was maybe one or two submarines in the area was I was moving my convoys up along the coast like this into Calcutta I've been doing that almost the entire campaign and do you see what that does I basically was driving around 10 enemy subs and never once was I in any threat of them intercepting me because they were not moving they were on single hex patrols so I would literally have to drive through them to get intercepted but that's why I don't do this so now I know that we dodge a lot of bullets I mean I probably had 200 ships come into Calcutta um, while these subs were in place and we just skirted around them the entire time all right, uh, we'll quickly take a look at Lashio. Uh, this is actually surprising. I thought he had way more troops here. He only had 390 AV, and a lot of it wasn't very good. The 1st Burma Division is, is no good, so that would have folded up easily. Um, these guys are no good. Almost all these guys are trash. I didn't realize that. I thought the British 18th Division was here. It is not. So... Once we had initiated some bombardments at Lashio, I would have quickly determined that the troops that he had here were just trash. And I probably would have just attacked the dang thing. He had was not building forts. Supply was good, but I think we could have pushed these guys down in three turns. Three to four attacks and completely wiped them out. And he was moving additional units like... I don't know what these guys are even doing, but I'm trying to move them down this way, I guess, to get back into China. Um, basically, Lido was more or less undefended here. This battalion was no good. He had a very small Chinese uh, infantry division here. Indian Brigade here, which is not that good. And another Chinese infantry division here. And I would have killed all these very easily. I had, as you can see, I had a division basically split up to deal with all of this. So we would have shut this down very easily. Now, let's take a look at Ceylon. I was starting to plan for an invasion of Ceylon. And honestly, it would have gone pretty well. Because he only had about 300 AV on Ceylon. And none of it was particularly great. So two divisions would have probably done just fine taking this place out. That sub uh, was hit by Type 95 depth charge. Well, okay. Now, looking at India, Madras was definitely on my list of places to go. I had about 800 AV moving down this way towards it. 
And you know what? Uh, that would not have been enough because at Madras, he had a huge assortment of troops here. 700 AV, um, which is a lot. Now, some of these aren't very good, but, you know, still, it is what it is. That's still 700 AV sitting on size 3 forts on times 2 terrain. This would have been a bit of a grind to take that out. Uh, so I'm kind of glad that we didn't have to deal with that because that's no good. Hyderabad, which we were going to be taking in about two turns, only had 86 AV in there. We would have blown right through that. I had about 1,000 right here. <clears throat> but we can see this is definitely where his main line of defense was going to be. Bombay, the Bhopal, and this is that red line. This was his red line in India that he was going to defend. We know he had carriers here. We know he moved in uh, troops coming in this way and also in a Karachi. So no shortage of troops are well on the way into India. But at Bombay, this is what he had. Um, a lot of stuff. Some of it in strat mode. I don't know why. 18th British Division is here. I thought they were somewhere else. So uh, there they are. Uh, some other Indian brigades here. About a thousand AV total. It's a lot. Aircraft, look at this. Quite a bit of stuff here. B-17 D's and E's. Buffaloes from, um, Malaya. AVG's here. P-40's. A bunch of Vildebeest that he rescued from, uh, Malaya. Most of that stuff made it out of here. Okay, at Bhopal, he had more fighters and some blennies. Troops, about 700 AV. So that's, a, that's 1,700 AV on this line right here. And another 150 there. So almost 2,000 AV right here. That would have been very difficult for me to pierce through at this time with the troops that I had currently in India. I had six divisions in India with more planned... But I couldn't move them in until I had KB back to the Indian Ocean to protect those convoys. Because I'm not willing to risk whole divisions at sea. Knowing that his carriers are possibly in the area. And they were. But I think this was about as far as we were going to get until additional reinforcements came in. But at that point, it would have been too late for me. Because he already has 1700 AV there. Another 500 here. Another 200 there. And probably over a thousand more coming in. From Cape Town so India would have quickly become a bit of a bridge too far for me uh, with the amount of force that he had currently in place and the amount that he had coming in and quite honestly I'm surprised by that number I didn't think he had that much there but he did and it would have been really hard there's six Australian division which is very very good it would have been a heck of a of a time trying to push further north into India with that much troops. In Delhi, a bunch more of his four-engine bombers, some more B-17Ds and Es, and some LB-30 Liberators. So basically all of his B-17 and LB-30s that he could possibly move around on the map were here in India. So I'm kind of glad we didn't have to push much further because it would have been more and more difficult to take anything here at that point so I think Helson's line in the sand was here and I don't see us capable of really doing much more with that especially once those American divisions and all those supporting aircraft and engineering units got into Bombay that would have been no good all right so I was pretty surprised by India uh, I, his position here in my opinion was not bad but now let's finish off with China and this is where I'm really surprised because it, despite what you guys might think, my opinion is, is that his position in China is actually very, very strong. Much stronger than I think he understood. So let's talk about it. Firstly, remember that big battle we had in Luchao and all the troops I lost there? Well, I just found out now that he abandoned it. He left it. I don't know why. I wish I'd known. I would have been awesome to get in there and take it. You know, I've, in three or four turns, I could have been in there. Uh, he appeared to have strapped moved all the troops in 
uh, Lu Chao up to Taiyun. And I don't exactly know why. But heck, look at them all. 1300 AV in Taiyun. At Kuai Lin, 1000 AV. Jeez, that's a lot. I had no idea he had that much in there. Okay. I was actually planning an operation on Kukong. 1200 AV there. Good luck. Uh, strangely, they're in, in strat mode, and I don't know why, but um, there it is. Kukong with level 3 forts. That would have been a mess. Now, Changsha. Look at this. 2,700 AV in Changsha. That is a massive amount. And good supply. Forts size 4. Changsha would have been a disaster to take that to. Uh, I would have never even had anywhere near enough troops to do it. So all said, all said and done, guys. Down in this part of of China alone, he had about forty five hundred AV, at least. Now I know it's Chinese, but that's a lot. This whole collection of troops here is massive. I I I, I, I don't know what I would have been able to do with that. Okay. Now we had a few partisan units up here. No big deal. None of these were any are particularly noteworthy, right? These units down here, trash. They're just out here kind of making a a little bit of ruckus, but they don't really have any power, right? Now, let's look at Lan Chao. So these are the guys who pushed out of Kung Chang, and actually they weren't nearly as hurt as I thought they were. Uh, this core is still pretty well intact. This one too. And I don't know if the troops I was sending up would have been enough to push through that, actually. Because I only sent a division and a couple regiments. It, it would have been a bit of a struggle to get up through these uh, these mountains. Lan Chao. Um, a, lot of, a lot of oil, so it does appear that we were able to stop the fuel flow taking that stuff, right? All right. So there we go. And he did have additional units sitting up here. More than I thought that he did. So it would have been a, a little bit of a struggle to get up here. Lan Chao still had 120 in it. Okay. Now this is where things get really dicey for me. And I didn't even realize it. Yikes. Okay. 300 AV there. 200 there. 1400 there. So right in this collection alone, over 2,000 Chinese AV on good terrain. That would not have been pretty. Okay, but it gets worse. Kianco, 1,000 AV in Kianco. Look at here. This, this little unit that caused them all kinds of issues, the one that kind of warped across, um, this thing had 1,700. So just right here, 20, let's call it 2,800 AV just right here. Guys, we're almost at 5,000 just right here. But it gets worse than that. Look at this. Thirty-four hundred in Chungking. Guys, 3,400 AV in Chungking. What in the heck? So if we add up this plus this plus this, we're looking at 8,500 8, AV plus some stragglers. Call it 9,000. Just up in here. Guys, what was he doing? We had a total of four divisions in the Chungking Plain. I had, uh, call it six. Okay, four divisions here, two divisions there. Uh, that's 2,400 AV. So on this whole area here, guys, I had 2,400 AV. Okay. If he had just come out of Chungking this way and down out of Kianco this way, he could have massacred. I had two divisions blocking this road here. He could have absolutely massacred us and just completely thrown us off the plains. I, I don't know what he was doing. He could have moved those troops out of Chungking, and even though the Chinese troops, when there's 3,000 of them, and they shock attack, I, there's no way I was going to stop that. I don't, I don't think. In my opinion, I don't think so. And if he had brought these guys in here, 
8,000 AV all kind of meeting in one point. Just no way I could have stopped that. So this is why I think Helsin's position in China is actually not bad at all. I mean, it's not great, right? We're already into here and all that stuff, but he had so many troops in here. It's shocking to me. So many troops down here. Um, and there was no way I was going to break through any of these places, right? I was not going to take Kuai Lin. No way I'm taking Tuyun. Kukong, Changsha. No way I'm breaking through down here anytime soon. Because the bulk of my troops were committed up here. And he outnumbered us badly. So for him to quit like this, I think he had a lot of fight left in him. I really do. You know, these guys here, they have supply. They're not having any issues. These guys, they got supply. These guys, they got supply. So he's not even really having a lot of supply issues right now. I mean, he will eventually, but not anytime soon. So that's that's it. This is the campaign, guys. This is where we were at. Um, Helsin has surrendered. He says he screwed up a lot of places. He said this whole uh, diversion of these troops was going to cost the... They were supposed to be in this hex moving this way. He somehow got diverted to here. We still don't know why. But it would have only taken him a week or two to fix that. And I had nowhere near enough troops coming down through this way to make up for the 8,000 AV that he had right here. I there's no, I had nothing close to that. If he had just been a little more offensively minded and just counterattacked us on the planes here, he would have sent us reeling and we would have been in serious trouble. But, you know, he just elected to turtle up this entire campaign and I think that's what led to his downfall. He induced all of the losses that he suffered, all of the bases I took, all of the setbacks that he had. It's because he kept retreating and retreating and retreating and retreating when he didn't really have to. He had strong positions in China that he just abandoned. He had what I think are strong troops in India that if he had four deployed down to Hyderabad, we wouldn't be taking this base. If that thousand AV was in Hyderabad, no way I'm taking it. Uh, we would have been stopped cold. Okay, If he had used these bombers up here a little more, we would be a lot worse off. He didn't. Um, if he had tried to slow us down in Burma, we wouldn't be about to take Lashio. He didn't. Um, the Philippines, he did fine here because I didn't push it the way I, I could have. Um, I, I don't know what else to say, but it's my opinion that Helsing gave up too soon. I am months and months and months away from being able to take out China with what I just saw. Months. Six, seven, eight months maybe before I would be in a position to have my entire army in Chongqing. And it would have been the mother of all battles and I would have lost so many troops taking it. So I think that was premature. I think his def his position in India was strong with all these troops coming on map here um, and they were imminent okay these guys were well on their way to Karachi and Bombay look at all these troops guys I had nothing in place to intercept these troops they would have got into Bombay unimpeded his carriers are here and mine are not he's strong here right now he's got a lot of naval forces out here I did not you know what I mean? Um, I wish he hadn't quit. And I wish we'd still be playing this because I think I would have started hitting a brick wall really quick here in India. Uh, and I would have started hitting some additional brick walls in China real quick. So here's the final victory point tally for the campaign. We were at a 3.056 to 1 win ratio, right? 19,633 to 64.25. I lost. 658 points of aircraft. He lost 345. Army lost points. 201 to 6500. I lost 82 ships. He lost uh, 207, which 
is not bad. He actually did really good with that. Um, I don't know what to say. Uh, what is your opinion of this? Do you think that he quit too soon? I sure do. Do you think he could have started counterattacking soon? I do. Um, some of you may ask, why didn't I find someone to pick up the game? Uh, the reason being is that I've always been opposed to pickup games. Um, you guys may know the Historical Gamer. He's got a, uh, another YouTube channel. He's playing a campaign right now that's had about five different Japanese players, and it turned into a, a laughing stock, a joke of a game. And I was very critical of him for doing that. And I, I told him, like, he played so well as, well, he and his team played so well as the allies that he basically shut down all of his Japanese um, players. And just made it so it's untenable for them. And he should have just taken the win and called it because it was so far gone for the Japanese player. Um, <coughs> there was nothing they were going to do. Now, this is far from being too far gone for the allies. Are his logistical trains, logistical setups underdeveloped? Yes. Could that be fixed? Yes. Is this pilot training up to snuff? No. It's not that great. I didn't see anything particularly great here. But that can be fixed. He's got a whole war to train stuff. But in fact, it's not even that bad. <coughs> Excuse me. So, yeah, a, a little light on logistics, but that's okay. Australia, unutilized resources. All these aircraft are sitting here doing nothing. Uh, well on its way to retaking Cooktown. Um, this is this is far from being gone, right? Uh, I, I don't know. I just think he quit too soon. But at the same time, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I was very critical of uh, THG for continuing to get new players, new players, new players. And I just didn't want to be like that. I wanted to... Um, yeah, there I figured it. I figured as much. Look at that. He's been supplying the Philippines with subs. And they're now getting their supply from Batavia. So... Uh, that's that. Anyway, off topic. Um, I did want to be hypocritical because I've criticized other players for just keeping campaigns going um, with multiple different players. And unlike th his campaign, this one can be salvaged by an allied player. But I just didn't want to do that. I, I just want to call it. You know, I wanted to play Helsin in this one, and he doesn't want to play it anymore, and that's fine. And I want to apologize to you, the viewers, the people who supported my channel and my Discord for not being able to get out of February 1942. This is the third campaign that has ended early for me now, in a row. The one against Lodric, I beat him in February 1942 in the big battle of the Bay of Bengal, right? Um, I was playing Helsin as allies, and just like he did, I quit because I felt like I was overwhelmed. So that's my loss to him. He was playing Scenario 2 as Japan, which I think is... Not very fair because he's a much better Japanese player than me. But now he got a taste of his own medicine, right? He's playing allies. I'm playing the Japanese on Scenario 2. And he realized how much it hurt. But it didn't hurt enough that he couldn't have salvaged his thing with all those troops and all these ships in India. So there we go, guys. Once again, I want to apologize to you guys for not being able to finish the campaign. This one was outside of my control, and I am sorry for that. But I don't want to just keep handing it around to the next player, the next player, the next player. I want to pick a player and stick with them and see it all the way to the end. So what's next for my channel? Well, I have my priorities are in this order. A priority one is now I'm going to give my full focus and attention to the Macho campaign. That's scenario one. And in my opinion, it's not going particularly well for me. But I'll never learn if I don't see things through. So I'm going to continue playing that, and that's going to be my main focus. I'm going to continue making videos for that, but they will be a little bit shorter than this, so you won't have to sit through an hour-long video all the time. They'll be maybe 20 minutes long at the most. So I'm going to continue doing that. Additionally, I am going to start increasing my tutorial videos output because on my, on my Discord, over the last month, I've picked up over 50 new members. A lot of them are new players, so this game is is reviving guys it's coming back it's coming back slowly and I want to help new players get better so I'm gonna increase my uh, tutorial video output now that I'm not playing two campaigns and last and this is a project that I just recently started and I'm really excited about 
I'm working on a scenario for version 26B, which is what this is. And basically, it's scenario 1.5. And here's why. In my opinion, scenario 1 is is not enough for the Japanese, right? It's kind of historical, right? But if you want to have any kind of chance of doing anything okay and and doing well, it's not enough stuff. Scenario 2, in my opinion, is a little too much for the Japanese. Uh, I have endless supplies of aircraft, pilots, ships, supplies. Guys, I had no constraints anywhere. I had more planes, more pilots, more aircraft pools, more supplies, fuel, oil than I could than I could use right now. And in my opinion, it's too much. So what I'm working on right now, and I'm working on this with uh, somebody in my Discord named Evoken, who's excellent with the editor. And I'm looking at bringing on another guy as well. We're basically going to take Scenario 2 and have it. So we're going to take the difference between Scenario 1 and Scenario 2 and make a Scenario 1 and a half. So it's going to have more ships, more supplies, more fuel, more aircraft than Scenario 1, but less than Scenario 2. Because in my opinion, there's a sweet spot in there, right? And Scenario 2 is too much. Scenario 1 is not enough. So my third priority for my channel and my War in the Pacific career is to finish Scenario 1.5. And I've already done a lot of work on it on my on my own time, uh, revamping the Japanese pilot pools and their experience levels and their how many pilots you get every month. Because right now you get too many. Uh, scenario one, you don't get enough. So I've kind of found a happy medium there. Uh, next, I'm going to address the R&D factories, the aircraft factories, the supply centers, the fuel, the resources. Because in my opinion, on scenario two, there's too much. So I'm going to bring it down to something in between Scenario 1 and 2. So, uh, again, land combat units. The Japanese get four extra divisions. I think it's four. Three or four extra divisions in Scenario 2 than in Scenario 1. So we're probably going to cut that down to two instead of four. Right? So Scenario 1.5. Let me know if you think that's something you'd be interested in. I definitely would love to play that. Because I don't like Scenario 1, and Scenario 2, in my opinion, is just a little too much. So, once I get Scenario 1.5 done, I might look to find an opponent who's willing to play that with me. And I think it would be a great mid-balance between too much and not enough. So, once again, guys, I apologize for this campaign ending abruptly as the other ones have. I promise you someday I will find an opponent, and I think I've got one right now, that we can go the distance on. Because I really want to see this game to the... I want to see 1945. I want to see what that's like. I just got to find the right person to do it with. And I think I've got him in Macho. I hope you guys will continue to support that campaign. Because it's going to get a lot more uh, attention now. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, comments, post them in the video. Come and see me on Discord and we'll talk about it. And please, I don't want to hear any disparaging remarks about Helsin. Um... Because he didn't do anything I didn't do to him. I quit on him when I was playing the Allies back in January, February. You know, so who am I to criticize him for doing the same thing? Did I quit too soon? Absolutely. Did he quit too soon? In my opinion, yes. So there you go. Uh, I'll end it on this note, guys. I am currently 2 to 1. I've got 2 wins and 1 loss. Let's see how I can do on the next campaign that I'm working now. Catch you guys on the next one.